Well, hi, friends. Good morning, and welcome to River Church's online worship. Today is October 4th, and today is actually the first Sunday that we are, we are back together in this building, and just, just a little bit, in this building for our, our regathering, our public worship. You're still at home, so I suppose that means you're not ready to get out, and I, I respect that. I love you, and that's why we're going to continue producing uh, this, th these online worship services. If you are ready to get out, just know that today, October 4th, we're meeting in public, 11 a.m. at the building. For, but for the rest of you, I invite you into uh, this worship time. We, we want to include you online. So we're about to get started. Uh, so get your communion elements uh, gathered up and ready. Get rid of distractions. Fill up your coffee cup. Um, if you want to know uh, what's going on at River Church uh, uh, this week, we've got prayer on Tuesday. We've got our Icon student ministry on Wednesday. We've got other opportunities to get together and to celebrate online, uh, virtually and in real time or, or together in person. So, so if you want to know what's going on, uh, go to riverchurchrgv.com and you can check out all of our offerings. All right, well, you get ready and we're going to start worship here in just a few minutes. 2020 has been one crazy year, hasn't it? I mean, we used to say so far, as in so far 2020 has been crazy, uh, like there's going to be a turnaround. But now it just seems like we need to get the year over with, like it's going to end the way that it started, right? Uh, at this point, it doesn't seem, seem like there's much hope for 2020. All you had to do was watch the presidential debate on Tuesday to sort of figure that out, huh? Pandemia, financial crises, the impeachment of a president. I'm talking about the year 2020. A census, the death of Kobe Bryant, the Summer Olympics canceled, so many hurricanes, so many hurricanes, they ran out of names. George Floyd in the season of racial tension like I have never seen in my lifetime and and I remember Rodney King and the LA riots of 1992 and we've had murder hornets and now all all of California is up in flames I read a news article on Tuesday regarding the fires in Sonoma County the news article was in San Francisco Times and they interviewed the Sonoma County Supervisor. Her name is Susan Gorin. She said, I'm sort of numb at this moment. You see, three years ago, Gorin lost her home to the Nuns Fire in North, Northern California. And now three years later, it looks like she's gonna lose her new home in the same neighborhood to another fire. She was on her way to a, a hotel to, to safety the night of this interview. And she said, it, it seems surreal to me that we would, we would be facing this again in some of the same areas that lost so many homes so traumatically just three short years ago. And then she said these words. It's like God has no sympathy, no empathy for Sonoma County. Maybe that's you right now. Maybe that's how you feel. Right in the middle of the crises that you're going through, maybe you would say, uh, I feel numb. Uh, I feel like God is mean. I feel like God just isn't very sympathetic. Well, today's message is just for you, my friend. On Monday, I was not feeling well. I wasn't feeling myself. So I decided to go get tested, tested for COVID and Fortunately, the, the results came back negative, but, but for me as well, this, this period of unrest has, has caused me to feel like my footing is a bit, it's, it's a bit un, uh, uneasy or a bit unsettled. We've all had a lot of time to think and eat and to pray and, and worry. Do you know that sales of live chickens, like baby chicks that grow up to, to, to be hens and lay eggs. It's gone through the roof, the sale of chickens. Uh, we tried to get some chickens and we had to wait like six or eight weeks. You know why? You know why the sale has gone up? Because um, many of us have thought about just, just cashing in 
and, and moving to the country and raising chickens. I mean, it's, it's been a tough year like that. People are reevaluating what they're even doing with their lives. Let me tell you about 70 straight tough years in the history of another nation. Seven decades of crises. It was, the his, it was in the history of the nation of Israel, a particularly dark season that they went through, beginning around 586 B.C., and it lasted for 70 years, and, and they were captives. They were captives in a foreign land. Uh, first, they were captive to, captives to Babylonia and then Persia. And during that dark, sad time, I mean, imagine, imagine if China defeated us and, and took us captive to Asia and moved in their own government to preside over those of us that were left here in the United States. Imagine that. During that sort of dark, sad time for the nation of Israel, the Lord gave his people, as they were being carried off to, uh, as captives, slaves to a foreign land, God gave them this instruction, Jeremiah 29. He said this, And work for the, pre, for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. Babylon was taking them captive, had just defeated them with their military might. And work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. Pray to the Lord. He says, pray to me, pray to the Lord for that city where you, where you were held captive. For if Babylon has peace, so will you. It sounds so crazy and mixed up that God would tell them, pray for the peace of your foreign country captive, uh, your, your foreign, uh, the country that has taken you captive, pray for their peace, you'll experience peace as a result. And, and the Lord makes this promise to the Jews when they're going through these 70 years of captivity and destruction. He says, I am disciplining you, but I am not destroying you. I am disciplining you, disciplining you in love not destroying you in anger. And so the book of Daniel, that's where we're going to spend the next five weeks. The book of Daniel, uh, I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be telling. I think it's going to be food for our souls. Uh, it's got several stories that maybe you, when you were a kid during your formative years, maybe you remember stories of lion's dens and fiery furnaces and, and miraculous escapes. Um, the book of Daniel, that's our study over the next five weeks. Uh, Daniel, you see, was a special young man. Um, he was probably about 15 years old when he was carried away into exile. About the age of my, uh, my fourth child, uh, Nolan, who was a freshman in high school. Daniel was about that age when they carried him off into exile because of his approximate age and his, the time in which he lived, uh, he was living during the, the, the nation of Israel, specifically Judah, Judah's, uh, their final days of their sovereignty as their country was coming unraveled, as everything was coming apart, uh, their, ultimately their demise and captivity. It was fast approaching. And because of his age, Daniel... Uh, he was probably uh, around to hear the preaching of the great prophet Jeremiah. And so he took those words with him, Daniel did, young Daniel did, when he was carried away into captivity, arrested, carried off. And, and Daniel actually lived through the entire uh, period of what they call Neo-Babylonian dominance. So he saw it coming. And he experienced it as it happened, this trauma that took place in his nation. Uh, Daniel survived under the rule of three different foreign kings. And, and each time, each time God esteemed Daniel in the court of each one of these three foreign kings. He was exiled, Daniel, uh, about 605 B.C. Again, as things were beginning to be to, to come unraveled, 
and he was chosen among uh, along with several other um, young Jewish men to serve in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. Even though he was a foreigner and he was brought in as a captive, these young men were esteemed and they were chosen, handpicked. You remember some of the stories? Daniel, he interpreted prophetic dreams. He watched his friends escape the fiery furnace. He escaped the lion's den. Uh, and he received divine prophetic words from the Lord. The recurring theme throughout this entire book over the next five weeks is God's sovereignty over human affairs. The fact that God's in control in the midst of the chaos of human affairs. So there's, there are five cool stories that we're going to look at over the next five weeks. Story one I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes. Uh, maybe, you've, maybe you've heard of the, the Daniel fast. Well, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Story number two is Daniel's friends uh, being thrown into the fiery furnace. We'll talk about that next week. Story number three, King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to call him King Neb. He mocks God, and as a result, God turns the king into a wild animal left to wander um, the, the forest and eat grass for seven years. Story number four, a, uh, a ghost like a large hand, shows up at the king's feast and writes a mysterious message of doom on the wall. I can't help but think of the hand in, uh, in the Adams family. Um, that's week four. And then week five, the story is Daniel in the lion's den. Five different stories in which humans go through traumatic affairs and we realize that God is in control. All right, today, story one. You ever heard of the Daniel fast? Anyone uh, ever gone, uh, done that fast? I'm going to call it more of a diet than a fast. I won't go into it in, in, in real detail, but it was kind of the rage. It was kind of a fad, uh, especially among Christians a few years ago. They, we, we attempted to, uh, as best we could, I never did it, but uh, mimic the, the dietary laws that Daniel followed in his day as a good Jewish young man. There were certain religious dietary laws that he would follow. They seemed to work well for his, him, for his health, his mental and physical and emotional health. And so a few years ago, uh, several people, or many people around the country were attempting the Daniel fast. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Let's read from Daniel chapter one, the very beginning of the book, it says this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiah, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So Jehoiakim is the king of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar is a foreign king, and he comes in and he takes over. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the vessels of the house of the Lord. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, see the little g, Nebuchadnezzar's fake God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family uh, and of the nobility, youths, this would have been Daniel and his friends, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And then, and then he wanted the eunuch to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. And, the, and of the wine that the king drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among them, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them these names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. I'm going to continue calling him Daniel over the next five weeks. Hananiah he was called Shadrach, 
Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. And I'm actually going to call them by their new names because we, we tend to do that in the church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we've got Daniel, Belshazzar is his new name, Daniel, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Going on with the story, I'll just tell you a little, little bit of it rather than reading it all to you. Daniel has a crisis moment because Daniel says, we can't eat these, the, the, the food of this foreign king. We, we as, as Jews, uh, as followers of Jehovah God, we are bound by our country's dietary religious laws. And so he appeals the eunuch who's in charge of his diet and in charge of his education over the next few years. And he says, look, we've got to eat what we've got to eat because we're Jews and we have to follow our religious dietary law. And the eunuch says, look, the king's going to get angry with me if you guys get scrawny or if you lose weight or if you, 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 know, you, you, you lose some of your appeal. And Daniel says, let's try it for 10 days and see how it goes. And actually it goes quite well. And they develop over those 10 days and over the next several years quite well. Picking up with verse 17, it says, As for these four youths, the four young men, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. No one else could be compared. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. So Daniel and the other three young men, they wanted to follow their own or their nation's dietary religious laws. Uh, they missing their homeland. They want, they want to be true to their God. And even though they're now being held captive in a foreign land, they still have the, the wherewithal to say, we're going to do this. And so they go on sort of a hunger strike, and ultimately the jail guard relents and gives them 10 days to prove that they can survive, even thrive, and it works out. So we, as followers of the same God, the God of the Bible, we can, we can rightfully rejoice God showed his children favor. He esteemed them in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. He found them to be 10 times more wise and understanding than the king's magicians and enchanters. We, we, can, we can celebrate that, yes, but, but, we must also remember that they're captives. They're captives in a foreign land. They will at the end of every day be es escorted back to their jail cell. I think I would have been moping around, struggling with anxiety, missing my family, feeling sorry for myself, trying to escape maybe. Uh, some would perhaps have even been driven to thoughts of suicide. And yet these four young men Stay the course. They, they, they follow the instructions of their God and they stay the course. And what do we learn from their story? I've got three big ideas that I think we can pick up from today's story. Number one is this. When I am fragile, God is not. When I am fragile, God is not. So what do you do when you wake up on a uh, one morning and you're just fragile. You're just, you're just shaken. You just feel like, I, I can't make it anymore. You remind yourself that, that while I am fragile, God is not. And we're going to talk more about that here in a bit. Let me get to the second big idea. It's this. When I don't see the end game, God does. You know what I mean by the end game? Like, I don't even know how 2020 is going to end. 
I don't know what 2021 is going to look like. I don't know what God's doing. When I don't see the end game, it takes courage to trust that God does. And I'm going to carry on in obedience because God does. God knows how this ends. Isaiah 46 says this. God says this. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. I say, the words of the Lord, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. When I look at the moment, when I look at the near future and I don't see the end game, God does. Big idea number three is this. Faith, not fate, is in control of my life. You may feel today like, like you're just being tossed to and fro by circumstances, like you've just lost your way at sea, and it's merely fate that is throwing you this way and sending you that way. Believe, dear child, today that it is faith that is control of your life. And when your faith is weak, know that God in Christ is strong on your behalf. Last big idea, and then I'm going to kind of unpack these a bit um, as a whole. Last big idea is this. In the end, the Lord will prevail. In the end, the Lord will carry the day. If I am a child of God, I am to believe this, that in the end, the Lord will prevail. He has told me he will. In the end, the Lord will carry the day. He has promised that. So over the next five weeks, we look at some pretty tough circumstances. I mean, Daniel goes through some really tough times. And in the end, how was he rewarded? In the end, what did it all accomplish? Well, that's what we're going to find out. If we're honest with each other, we would have to say that, that like Daniel, different circumstances, but like Daniel, you and I, we, we are going through some tough days. And here's the truth. These days will end. This tough season will end. And there will be more tough days ahead in the future. Different circumstances, different periods of time. And the question is, why? Like, what's the point? Why does God allow or why does God cause or ordain or whatever word you choose? Why does God let me go through these tough days? Why did God let Daniel go through those tough days? The last verse in the entire book of Daniel, the very last verse in the very last chapter we're going to jump ahead to the end. The end of the life story of Daniel. What did the Lord promise him? This is how it ends. He says, As for you, the Lord says to Daniel, As for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. And we've talked about that much over the last few months, haven't we? That there is an inheritance for us. In Christ Jesus, there is an inheritance for us that we receive, that we are living for ultimately. This is the promise for which Daniel lived his whole life. That in the end, the Lord would prevail. That in the end, the Lord would deliver him. That in the end, the darkness of his troubles would, would be drowned out by the faithfulness of God, that God would prevail in the end. So let me ask you, what lion's den of existence are you experiencing right now? And God says, your darkest days, they will end. The Lord will prove himself faithful, and you will be more prepared for the next dark day to come. You want to know one purpose of today's dark season 
It's that you build strength, you build stamina, that the next dark season might be that much easier to walk through. I talked about being fragile when God is not. You, you might have woken up this morning with this feeling of, of helplessness, a sense of being out of, out of control. Remind yourself today that, that your God in heaven is not out of control. And live your day relying on that truth that when you are fragile, God is not. When you aren't at your best, God is still on the throne. And the Lord makes the promise to you and to me like he did the nation of Israel so many years ago when they were in captivity. The Lord makes this promise. He says this, I am carrying you through these dark days. I am carrying you through the fire. I, I, I may be disciplining you, but I am not destroying you. I may be disciplining you in love, but I am not destroying you in my anger. God knows the beginning and God knows the end. So we wrestle, we, we wrestle with the biblical, tr biblical truth that in the middle of my suffering and in the middle of my trouble, I find God. Dr. Tony Evans, he says this. It often takes the darkness of the storm to show us the light of God's presence and power. And I would say that, that if that makes sense of the, of the trouble and the difficulty of my life, that the, that the darkness of the moment allows me to see the brightness, the faithfulness of God uh, more clearly, then, then bring it on. I'm willing to go through that. As long as I know that the difficulty is for a purpose, I can handle some difficulty. So can you, because you're strong. As long as you know that, that it's not faithful, it's faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. You may see, why am I going through this storm of despair, Pastor Randy? Why am I going through this dark time? And I would say it's because God wills that you see the light of his presence, the lightning bolt of his power. Sometimes I don't see it. Not until he, not until the God of the universe turns off the lights for, for the moment, he turns off the lights in the room, and then I have this reckoning, this aha moment. I see the light of the power of the faithfulness and the glory of God in my life. It's in those dark times in which God shines the brightest. Yeah, it's hard for me to say the purpose of COVID-19. It's hard for me to say the purpose of all the other, all the rest of the trauma of 2020. God has not revealed that to me, and I would not, I would not dare to guess what his purpose is in all of this. But we do know that God wants us to thrive in the middle of dark days. And we do know that, that God delights to bring his children through these dark days and out of the darkness and into the light. He delights to deliver us from the lion's den. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next five weeks. I invite you now to the table of communion right there in the privacy of your own home. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup and he invited his closest friends, his disciples, to, to eat and to drink and to, in so doing, celebrate what he was about to do on the cross. He invites us to do the same. Jesus says, from now on, from now on when you eat this bread, do so remembering that, that my body, the body of Christ, was broken for the forgiveness of your sins. When you drink from this cup, do so knowing that the, the blood, my blood, Jesus said, was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. For whenever you do this, do so remembering me. We remember the fact that, that Christ's work on the cross bought for us forgiveness, 
and bought for us relationship with God so that our lives now are not lived in a fateful manner, but in a faithful manner. That, that we are now children, sons and daughters of the living God because of what Christ has done to reconcile us to the Father. So celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus in the bread and the cup. I invite you right there in the privacy of your own home. Serve yourself, serve your friends or your loved ones there with you, and in so doing, celebrate Jesus. Okay, well, uh, that's a wrap for today. I, I'm just so honored that you allowed me to come into your home uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, I'm, I'm also thankful that you're, you've been able to, in some way, uh, join those of us that are worshiping here in the building today, October 4th. You're at home, and that's cool, that, that's awesome, and you've been able to be a part of what's going on at River Church in, in some fashion. So, so that's, that's great, that's awesome. We're going to, as I said, continue uh, pushing out these videos every Sunday morning for as long as you need to stay home, and then when you're ready to join us publicly, uh, at the building at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Look forward to seeing you then. If you have any questions about River Church, uh, go to our website. If you uh, have questions for me, your pastor, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. And if I can serve you in any way, if we, your elders, can serve you in any way, we would love to do so. Now is a great time for you to go online and give. You can give virtually on our website. Just, just click the giving button. It's easy. It's intuitive. It's safe. It's kind of fun. You can also mail a check. The uh, mailing address is there on the website. So, hey, uh, we are praying for you as you are praying for us. And I look forward to seeing you again soon here on the Internet.